Chapter 15, if you remember, this is a worship service. Um, this is a worship service that is uh, being held in, in heaven, in the temple in heaven, uh, a worship service prior to the bowl judgments. Remember, we were in, in color commentary where we were just stuck on the seventh trumpet and we were holding up on the seventh trumpet and looking back, and in some cases looking forward, as to what was going to happen and also looking back at what did happen. We were filling in the blanks of all of the information about the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments. And now chapter 15 says, wake up, get, get your mindset because we're going to go to the bold judgments now. And the bowl of judgments is the final wave of wrath, of God's wrath on the earth. That's what's coming. And chapter 15 brings us and sort of shakes us back to the current position that says, okay, here we go. Things are going to happen now. In, in a preliminary, in preliminary to the bowl of judgments, there's a worship service. We find the, uh, in heaven the tribulation saints. The tribulation saints are there. Uh, along with, we'll see angels that are there, as well as we'll look at the holiness of God. All of that's going to come together in this chapter 15 as a preliminary to the launching of the, what I call angel flight. That's all the angels that are, that'll pour out the bowls of judgment upon the earth. Interesting that that this takes place prior to all this destruction, and you start thinking, what is this all about? Well, it's all about the holiness of God. Judgment follows the holiness of God. The holiness of God demands perfection, that man has fallen short of perfection, and God judges that. And what he's judging here, he's judged us already, right? He's judged his believers. How did he do that? On the cross. On the cross, yeah. We've been judged as fallen short. He says, okay, you've fallen short. I'm going to pay for that shortness. I'm going to impute Christ's righteousness to you, and I'm going to take your sin, and he's going to become sin for you, and I'm going to judge it and execute it. And God did that. Now, what, what do we have left over? Well, we have left over all the ones who did not accept that offer, and God's holiness is now going to judge that. So there's a worship service in heaven, the worship of God's holiness. And it's, it's awe-inspiring as we see and look at what these, what these uh, tribulation saints will be singing and talking about and what the angels will do. And that's all in preliminary to the launching of the bowl of judgments. So, let's go to uh, chapter 15, and we're going to look at verses uh, 3 and 4. We've already found out that the tribulation saints, they, they're dressed in white linen, they have the harps of God, and they're about to sing, and they're standing on the fiery sea, Remember the fiery trials that they went through? These are people who have been redeemed from the Antichrist. God has, has snatched them and pulled them out of all of the, the tribulation, and they have been blessed by doing that. He calls them overcomers in verse 2. He says, he says that they have, uh, they have overcome the beast, they've overcome the mark of the beast, they've overcome the entire system that the Antichrist had. And, and they are blessed. And so they're in heaven, and they're now getting ready to sing a song, actually two songs we're going to sing, of victory. All right. So here we are in, in chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. And they, that's the tribulation saints, sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying... Now, what they're doing here is that there's a preamble. They're going, to, they're going to make a statement first. Then they're going to sing the song of Moses, and then they'll sing the song of the Lamb, those two songs. But the first thing they do is they make a statement. That's in, uh, in verse 3. It says this, and they're quoting Scripture to God, form of worship. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty, righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. So, it says they, they sing the song of Moses. By the way, that's an easy one to find because it's, it's labeled. The, the, the song of the of Lamb is not. But we're going to look first at the song of Moses. Turn to Exodus chapter 15. We're going to read just a few verses of these just so you get the tone as to what they are singing. The song of Moses. Exodus chapter 15, verse 1.
And this is a song that was that was sung by the Israelites after they had been redeemed from the power and, and oppression of Pharaoh. The, uh, and Pharaoh, as we look look back, he's a type of Antichrist. He wanted to oppress and destroy Israel, and that's exactly what the Antichrist wants to do with Israel. He wants to destroy Israel. That's one of the objectives in order to stop the Messiah from returning. So verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 1, and as we read through this, be thinking as the tribulation saints and how their redemption parallels that of the Israelites because that's what they're singing. They're singing along, along with them because their redemption parallels it. So verse 1, then Moses and the uh, sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. We can all sing that. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will extol him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his armies he has cast into the sea and the choices of his officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deeps cover them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. And you can continue reading on and you can see how they are praising what is about to happen on the earth. God's right hand, Jesus Christ, will return and he is going to shatter the armies of the enemy. He'll destroy them. And, and he, in essence, will redeem mankind as a result of that. All right, so that's, that is the song of Moses. And then next they sang the song of the Lamb. That was a little tougher to figure out. Which, what is the song of the Lamb? Because it's not named. It doesn't tell you where to go to find the song of the Lamb. But most of the commentators that I read pointed to Psalm 22, the 22nd Psalm. And so turn there, the 22nd Psalm. And the 22nd Psalm is about what? what? What do you guys remember about the 22nd Psalm? Crucifixion. David crying crucifixion. crucifixion. I heard it. It's about the crucifixion. And you think, what, the song of victory is about a crucifixion? Well, it's pretty interesting. When we go to, to the 22nd Psalm, it talks about, it certainly talks about the man being stuck on a cross, being, being stapled, nailed to a, a tree, a cross, and the, and the agony that he goes through, and it talks about how he's surrounded by the, the, the dogs of Bashan. He talks about that. It's a, it's a psalm written hundreds of years, even before the crucifixion was even invented as a means of torturous death. But it, it, it prophesies and predicts what the Messiah would go through, and it talks about how he was surrounded by the dogs, by the Pharisees, who stuck their lip out at him and tried to humiliate him while he's on the cross stripped probably naked there and going through the suffering that a man goes through when he's crucified. What's so interesting about this is that it, it turns from defeat to victory. And, uh, and when Christ died, he cried out with, with a, a voice, it says, with a loud voice, that it is finished, it is done. That's part of the last words of the Savior on the cross. <clears throat> And what's unique about that is a man on a cross dies from suffocation. He dies from exhaustion. He can't pull himself up anymore to breathe. And he eventually has no breath left, and he just dies. Suffocation. So in other words, there are no words that a man can say when he dies on the cross. And yet Christ, it says, he cried with a loud voice, It is finished. It's done. And it was such a statement that was made that the centurion, who obviously had witnessed hundreds of executions, he turned and he said, truly, this man was the son of a God. He called the son of God, and literally it's the son of a God. He recognized that this was a highly, highly unusual and a supernatural event. So it was a cry of victory. So in Psalm 22, it is right after the death of the Savior on the cross, and the whole scene change, changes in verse 22. And there's a sense of peace now and victory. I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him, that is, God's face from Christ. But when he cried to him 
for help be heard. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied. You can imagine the people who were suffering during the tribulation with food shortages. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom, and he's talking about here the millennial kingdom, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. And the millennial kingdom, that's David's son. He's going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem, and he's going to rule all the nations. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust will bow before him, even he who cannot keep his soul alive. Posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will, who will be born, that is all the people in the millennium who will be born, that he has performed it. So these songs that they sing, there's, there's three commonalities in these two songs. One is God is omnipotent, that he is almighty. No one can stop him. Number two, that he is right and just and true. His judgments are true and that comes from his holiness. And number three is he is the king of the nations. He will rule the nations, all of the nations. This is the time when the times of the Gentiles is finally over. You know how the Jew always talked about the times of the Gentiles? When will they be over? When will there finally be a king of David that will sit on the throne? That's when he will sit, and that's when uh, the king of the nations will occupy the throne. Okay, so on your worksheet there, chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, these overcomers, these are the tribulation saints, sing two songs of victory in their celebration, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Both celebrate God's victory over Satan. That's God's victory over Satan. Satan thought he had the Messiah on the cross, and he had him. But when he cried, it is finished. Ah, bad deal. Here's one right here. Yeah, there's... Oh, okay. Good. Anyone else need a worksheet? Yeah, Mona in the back? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, we're good. The song of the Lamb is likely from Psalm 22, which describes the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. Verses 1 through 21 show the agony of the Savior and in Satan's eyes his victory over God's Son. But after his death, the agony of defeat the agony of defeat turns to victory over the oppressor. The agony of defeat turns to victory. It is finished was a cry of victory, not defeat. The same could be said of the tribulation saints. Their death was not defeat. Their death was not defeat as it was in the eyes of the beast, but victory. It was victory. Next we move to the, the holiness of God. We said this judgment comes forth from, from His holiness. Chapter 15, verse 5 in your Bibles. The holiness of God. <clears throat> After these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. Uh, that tabernacle of testimony was the holy of holies. That's where God, in a sense, lived or resided when He was with Israel. That's where... The, uh, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would be able to go in one day of a year, one person, and just the high priest, that's where he would go. On your worksheets, the tabernacle of testimony refers to the Holy of Holies, or the inner room. The inner room, it's the most withdrawn room that God resided in. The inner room where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. It pictures the innermost recessed room that houses the holiness of God. As we go through this chapter, I just want you to keep thinking of the holiness of God, the holiness of God. It is from the depths of God's holiness that the final group, the final group of seven angels emerges. These angels will be inside of that temple and they'll come forth from that temple. The message here is that the source the source of God's wrath is His holiness. And He takes His final and complete action against man's rejection of His Son. The 
next thing we see in verse 6, the majesty of God. We've seen the holiness of God. Now we look at the majesty of God. This picture I have that I, that I put on these slides for you, this was taken from the Hubble telescope. And it's a, di a dying uh, uh, supernova. And uh, some of the astronomers, I, uh, I saw a red commenting on this, joked about it, and they called it the hand of God, joking. And, and yeah, joking. I wouldn't be joking about that. You know? I think God in his, in, in his grace, mercy, and wisdom sh is trying to show man his majesty through creation. But only believers can see that. Even in the clouds. Even in the clouds. We can see it in the stars, all of his creation. It's just shouts of God's majesty and holiness. And so we see the majesty of God in, uh, in verse 6 here. And let, let's read it. Remember, I'm the, let's go back to verse 5. After these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was open. Verse 6, And the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their ch uh, chest with golden sashes. With golden sashes. These, uh, they're coming out with the sashes that's the sign of the majesty of God, also the authority that they have, that they've been delegated to be able to execute the judgment of God. The plagues that it talks about, I think I, talk, I told you last week, there's not necessarily biological plagues that they will carry, but it, it's a, it gives you the sense of the scope of the damage that it will do. It's going to be not just a localized thing, but a wide range of damage that it will do. That's the plagues that they will carry. And on your worksheet there, the seven angels that emerge are majestic. Emissaries of the majesty of God. Their appearance in bright white linen speaks of the, of the righteousness of their mission rightness of their mission. The golden sash, golden sash shows the holy authentication of their mission. God's wrath to this point has been poured out using the tools of nature, uh, warfare, famine, and pestilence. Remember that, those are the seal judgments. And tools of demonic beings, that was more of the trumpet judgments, being released on earth. Now the final phase comes directly from the throne room of God himself. <clears throat> this is, this is, he's not going through any other in, uh, medium or intermediary. He's going to pour out these judgments on his own. Any questions on this so far, comments on this? I have a favor to ask. Yeah, Could sure. You put 15 back up on the screen for maybe 10 seconds? 15 five? Yeah, maybe I 10 will do seconds that. of it. All right. I missed a couple. How about that? Okay. Yeah, stop me if I'm going too fast. No, that was my fault. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Any questions? Everybody okay? Good deal. We're moving kind of rapidly through this because I want to get to these bold judgments. Verse 7. Then one of the four living creatures up here, and you take a look at the four living creatures. Remember the four living majestic creatures that we saw around the throne room of God? They had, each had a different head. One had the head of an ox, and the other, other one of an eagle, one of a man, and one of a lion. So one of those four, those guys, is, is the one, and he's the one handing out the bowls. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The bowl represents the delegation of God's authority to deliver a devastating blow to earth. So on your worksheet there. We need a new one. What? Well, we're out. No, on the back. Back. We're out. My bad. <laughs> okay. On the worksheet, turn the page. One of the awesome four living creatures from around the throne arms each angel's warhead by giving them each a bowl. Authority to deliver the full of the wrath of God. When the bowl full of the wrath of God is mixed, is mixed with each plague that the angel carries, these final weapons of God's judgment are armed. That's what he's arming them with. 
The seven angels are now ready to deliver the seven bowl judgments, which we will see in the next chapter. And the last thing that we see, awesome. And the temple was filled with smoke in, on your, on your, uh, in your Bibles. And the temple, this is the heavenly temple, there's a temple in heaven. And the heavenly temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God, from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Smoke filled, cloud filled, that's always a symbol and a, and a, a sign of the presence of God. Um, remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, they had Peter, James, and John up there with Christ, and then suddenly they were surrounded by the cloud. And, uh, and then Peter wanted to go build, build altars for uh, Moses and, and Elijah and for Jesus. And what, what did the voice say out of the cloud? This is my beloved son, hear him. In other words, he's not like any of the other, he's not a, a normal man. This is my beloved son, hear him. And that, that was God the Father that was speaking. The cloud was there. In Exodus chapter 40, um, this is where the children of Israel, the Israelites were, were, were in the desert and they, they had a tabernacle, a tent, that was built for worship by God's design. And it says this, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, the cloud, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In Isaiah's vision, when he found himself in the throne room of God in Isaiah chapter 6, it says this, And one called out to another, one angel calls out to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out. And the temple was filled with smoke, with the cloud. There he is again. So let's go to your worksheet for number eight there. The presence of God. The presence of God is often indicated by the appearance of a cloud or a smoke-filled temple. It is God's glory that produces the cloud and smoke. At the dedication of Solomon's temple in 1 Kings, chapter 8, 10 through 11, we find that this, it happened that when the priest came from the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. You can imagine the, being a priest there and, and watching the cloud just come in around your feet, fill up the temple, so that you couldn't even uh, minister or even stand. I'm sure they had to go to their knees to, in worship. Yes, Do sir? we think that maybe these people are the most wicked people that ever lived, like a bunch of pharaohs and Hitlers, that these particular people are the generation that has to go through this horror? I mean, mm. I just... That's a good question. Well, um, I don't think so. <laughs> I think that these people are what we would consider normal. Um, we have to remember a couple of things. One is, what happens when God has had enough with man? <coughs> my, my spirit will not strive with man forever. So what does he do? He removes the Holy Spirit. What happens to the church when he removes the Holy Spirit? It goes up too. All right. So, so the restraint upon man and, and at the heart of man what did Paul say about, about himself? He says, in me dwells no good thing. I think the heart of man is really revealed during this period of time. When the spirit is gone, also demons are given pretty much full control during this time. And we see that intermixing. I can only imagine what it must be like. But there, is a, there, there will be a persecution of those who believe to, to a point we've never seen before and a rejection and rebellion against God that we've never seen before. But I think that it's the heart of man being just open bare against God. So it's a revealing. That's a revealing, yeah. That's, 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 that's how I look at it. Anybody else have any, anything on that? That's, that's the best that I can, I can say that. Any other questions so far? Good question, Sherry, thank you. Um, one other note here, one, before we go on to the, the uh, bowl judgments, um, I, you know, I, I've been reading a, one of my books that I use as my go-by for studying this. 
a guy by the name of, of Dr. Epp, Dr. Theodore Epp, and he had a commentary. And uh, one of the questions was, is, uh, is how long, how long? You know, we're sitting on a power keg right now, powder keg, of God's long suffering over man. God's uh, fuse burns slowly, but when it ignites, stand by, kaboom, it goes. And so the question was, um, when does the fuse hit the keg? And, and Dr. Epp had three responses to that, and I wanted to pass these by you. Number, number one, when his love is derided and sneered at by men. You know, we see the great professors of today, you know, they take our, no longer our children, now our grandchildren, for me anyway, and they tell them that there is no God and there's no Son of God and there's no, no godly love, but that human love conquers all. That's, that's the, the message. And how's that working for us, huh? Human love? Oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's one, one that burns that fuse. Number two, when his reproof and outreach are consistently rejected. When God is, he reproves and he's also reaching out. When there's a, a consistent rejection of that over and over and over again, God reaches a point with individuals and nations when the fuse hits the keg. In 2 Thessalonians, I quoted some of this. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, and this was written 2,000 years ago. Only he who now restrains, that's the Holy Spirit, will do so until he is taken away. Then that lawless one is going to be revealed. That's when the Antichrist is going to be revealed, and that's when everything is really going to go downhill at that point. I'm sorry, what was that scripture? Uh, I'm sorry, it's 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 7 through 10. The, the, I didn't give you a scripture on the first one, but it's Galatians 6, 7 and 8. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. And the third one, the third point that he makes, and he says this is the third reason why the fuse hits the keg, when his long-suffering is mocked and, and ignored. When God's long-suffering is mocked. Second Peter, let's turn there. Second Peter chapter three. This is a good one to look at where we are today. Second Peter chapter three. Verse three. Second Peter chapter three. Verse three. Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come mocking, like mockingbirds, you know, those the constant, I don't know, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, everything just continues as it was from the beginning of creation. In other words, as we hear and read as, as believers, where is your Messiah? When is this, this myth that you call Jesus going to return? Uh, I don't know about you, but I hear mocking more now than I've ever heard it before. Directly and directed against believers, against Christians. And folks, I got to tell you, that kind of mocking always precedes persecution, the physical persecution. So what we're hearing right now may, over a period of time, start developing into the persecution of the church. But these mockers are mocking God and mocking Christ. And, and those three are when the fuse hits the keg. And, uh, again, uh, as I see things and hear things and look at the world unraveling, I just wonder how much longer, how much longer can this world go on the way that it is without Christ returning and without before the world would blow itself up? So, yes. It's a mocking of the principles that's so important, too, like homosexuality. We have to accept that. Yeah. Abortions, you accept that. Okay, you're just different. I mean... You know, you're not well, you're intolerant. See, that's the thing. That's, that's the word now. Yeah, yeah. Steve, you, you won't find people mocking other religions that way. No, I mean, what, what, what's the word on Islam? You know, it's in it. This very same people that mock Christianity support Islam and say it's a religion of peace. Yeah. What? <laughs> what, what have I been reading? <laughs> Ever read some of the things that come out of the Quran? I mean, that is pretty brutal stuff, right? What to do with us, the infidel, you know, cut their heads off, chop hands off, fingers off, and all that stuff. So it's, um, the world is moving us in that direction, and we see not just that, but also 
the, the ecumenical movement of the church. We'll be talking about that in, in chapter 17. Can't wait to get to that. This, this worldwide church concept where the, you know everybody hugs and kisses one another, whether you're a, um, a Hindu or a, a Christian, and everybody believes, and they accept everybody else's belief. That's called tolerance, and, and, and that's, what we should, that's what we should be doing. Um, one of my relatives included, uh, accused me of being intolerant, a bigot, and bullheaded. And I said, I said you know, I, I won the argument. They didn't have anything else to do. I said, you know, that's true. I am. I am intolerant, and I'm a bigot, and I'm bullheaded. Because that's what Christ was about his belief system. He did not accept anything according to what, other than what his doctrine was of what he was trying to tell men. And until God and Christ changes that, I'm going to try and follow that same thing. So if you want to call that intolerant, yes. On the other hand, I accept that there are other religions, but if someone asks me, how do I get to God, I will tell them there's only one way. That's because Jesus said that. And he certainly proved who he was, right? He rose from the dead. He said who he was, and he said, I'm going to prove it, but after three days, I'm going to rise from the dead. And he did. So, yes, I'm intolerant. So be it. Okay. Huh? I'm glad you are. <laughs> Ch chapter 16 now begins. You have a paper? I have a paper. Bet you thought I'm going to fool you guys and pass this one out. Okay, as those are being passed out, remember on our timeline where we are, we, we are all the way to, to this point, and all we have left to do is to see these, these seven bowls poured out. Once they're poured out, then the great and terrible day of the Lord will have taken place. Actually, the seventh bowl is this day, and this is a very, very short period of time. I take it maybe a couple of weeks, something like that, and so that's what we're looking at. This, this, these are the seven last judgments, the bowls poured out on mankind. There are no more pro uh, proclamations of the gospel. There's no more calls to repentance. No more angels flying in the heavens preaching the gospel. The two witnesses have long since been gone, and the evangelical call of the 144,000 has ceased. Time has run out. The condition of the world as Satan's rebellion enters its, finals day, its final days is this. God will no longer offer grace, mercy, and peace. Those who are sealed with the beast are doomed. All that remains is the final outpouring of God's judgment. The Jewish remnant has long since fled into the wilderness to escape the persecution of the Antichrist. The purges of those who refuse to be branded with the mark of the beast have resulted in multitudes being caught and executed. Half of the world population has been killed. The cumulative effect of the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments have battered the earth. Death and destruction are everywhere. Think of the worst horror movie and it won't come close. The Antichrist is in total control, yet the world he is controlling is falling apart all around him. His house and regime has been built on lies, deceit, murder, persecution, and dictatorial fanaticism. His house is crumbling. That's the scene of the world as we enter into now this final phase. God's wrath is unrestrained, God's long-suffering, time clock has run out, and the hand of justice will now be loosed. The final wave of God's wrath. And so what we have now is the command to open fire. Let's go to Revelation chapter 16, verse 1. 
It's in your Bible. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. This is the command to launch the attack, to execute the justice to the full extent uh, of God's uh, law. No leniency, no mercy, no commuted sentences, and no appeals to a higher court. Only justice. So on your worksheet there, the bold judgments take place near the end of the tribulation. There are no more calls to repentance. The door, the door to grace and mercy has now been closed for those with the sealing mark of the beast. While God's wrath, the door to, to grace and mercy has now been closed for those with the sealing mark of the beast. While God's wrath has been continuously distributed across the earth for, for seven years, it has now reached a boiling point. Only God's final judgment remains to be administered by seven angels carrying the bowls of the overflowing wrath of God. The term overflowing means it's unrestrained. God is not holding you back at all. They're just being poured out. This is it. And now this first bowl, verse, verse 2 in your Bibles. This is, this is horrible. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Boy, I, 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 I was going to put up on the screen here for you some images of, of people with sores and stuff. <laughs> So I'm not going to do that. I mean, it's a horrible looking thing. But I mean, that's what it's going to be. It's horror. You know, so look at the infection of these, in the, of these foul, malignant malignancies all over their face and all over their bodies. Like leprosy. Yeah, maybe worse. Yeah. Maybe worse. Yeah. Yeah. These, these, this is a worldwide mission. Uh, it's comprehensive and universal. It's not targeted to a certain area or people. We saw a, um, a plague uh, in Exodus poured out on, upon the Egyptians, right? Remember the boils? That was one of the plagues that was poured out. In fact, you'll see that some of these plagues parallel that of what happened with Pharaoh and the Egyptians, pointing to him again as a type of Antichrist. But this is, uh, this is not targeted. This is an angel that's going to fly around the world, and he's going to distribute that over the pop total population. But this is an intelligent virus in that it's going to seek out people with two conditions. What are the two conditions it tells you in Revelation 2? Mark of the beast and, and those who worship him. I think that's key because I think we talked about a couple of weeks ago about children that might be marked. You know, little innocent kids. Well, they're not going to worship. They don't know what to worship. So perhaps both of those are conditions for, the, for this virus to attack and to infect. And maybe the little kids will be, probably will be spared on this. They're, they're beyond or before the age of, of consent. Um, it was a, it's a foul smelling, horrible to the sight, sore and very painful. And I take it that there's no cure, that they, these people are going to suffer with this to the end. And you will see all the way to the fifth uh, bold judgment when we get there, that when darkness settles, that, that it it, it makes the, the sores even more painful. So it appears that these sores are going to be with these people over the, the period of weeks that the um, that these bold judgments will take place. And it's everybody that's left that or just that has the mark of the beast. Everyone that has everyone that's left that has the mark of the beast and worships worships the okay. beast. All right. So in other words, believers this won't attack them. They won't be infected with this. Normal little kids, I think, that, that, that of, of the unbelievers. They'll have to witness this, though. Oh, they'll see it, yeah, sure. See it on their parents, sure. Yep, this is a bad period of time. Okay, so, yes. So what is the mark of the beast? Okay, good, good question. Uh, the mark of the beast um, is a mark that will appear on a, a hand or on a forehead of people who, who will worship the beast and follow him. It's a mark that's required in order to purchase and sell anything. In other words, it's a form of controlling commerce, but
but it's also a, a mark of worship. They will make a decision to worship the beast. Those who won't will be killed. Right. But this will be something that, and we talked about the technology of today, where it has to be scanned, easily scanned, and also vis visually seen. Does that answer your question? Yes. You got it? Okay, good. Good question. Okay, so we are looking now at Revelation 16, 2. I think this is my last one here. The first bowl, the first bowl is poured out on the earth, and it contains a smart virus. A smart virus. It searches out, identifies, and infects. It searches out, identifies, and infects only those who have the mark of the beast. You can also put in there, if you want to, a little ticker that says, and who worship the beast. It searches out, identifies, and infects only those who have the mark of the beast and who worship the beast. What a message to the world. It wouldn't take long to see that the horrific disease affected only the unbeliever. 100% of the marked ones got sick, 100% of the unmarked ones were healthy. All those infected will appeal to the beast for his healing. That's their savior. They're going to go to him and say, heal me. But there is nothing that he can do to override or stop God's wrath. Then they will know. Steve, you talk, about, you talk about perhaps things embedded in the skin. Just sitting here thinking it may be that there is a, an infection, a reaction to the human uh, chemicals that they didn't foresee. If everybody got injected with something that they were going to have to be using for payments and whatnot, it might be actually a physical reaction to whatever is put underneath their skin. Yeah, it could be. That would be that would be pretty that would pretty much answer the idea that why were only they affected because they heretofore didn't realize the chemistry reaction to it. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, on the other hand, we can't limit it to a natural cause, sure, right? Sure. I mean, uh, God can certainly, and we'll see, some of the things that he's going to pull off with these bold judgments only come from heaven. Yeah. But, I mean, that could, could be how that happens. You know, it could be a chemical or something like that imbalance that causes this infection that creates boil. I don't know. But it's a good point, good possibility. And don't you think, that, that, I mean, Satan knew he lost when Christ died on the cross. Okay, he knew that. But he was still going to make, God was going to let him go until whatever time God had set for this to all end. And it, don't you think, I mean, it's just like a puzzle that, that he would uh, do all he's done just for that, a short period of time, which it is a short period of time that we're on earth. That, that, yes. Maybe he thought he could somehow reverse it. I mean, you know, at some to point, the bit end, do you think that Satan maybe that, that, that Satan thought he somehow he could win? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, so the question is, um, you know, kind of like LSU beating Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> it always comes back, like back to football. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Satan is the biggest liar that there is, and the, and the, and. I, I've known men in business that are such liars, they believe their own lies. You, you listen to a talk, and they talk themselves into a lie, and they're believing it. I think Satan believes his own lie, and he thinks he's going to win in the end. And you're just yeah. saying that, that people were asking for healing, but couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. You know, so at some point, all these people that accepted that mark and are suffering like this, they have to realize he's fake. I, I think that, that they, they may realize it, yet their heart is so hardened, just like uh, the pastor was talking about this morning. And we will see as these, these things, these, these waves go at one after another after another, that all they do is harden their hearts and they blaspheme God. It, it, the worse it gets, the more that they curse God. That's, that's, that's the result of the heart of man in rebellion. Just like Pharaoh did. They said like Pharaoh, like Pharaoh. Like who? Pharaoh. Like Pharaoh. Yeah, the hardness of heart. You have a question? Wait, hang on a second. We have a question or a statement. Yes. And they have, he's going to receive a meter next week that will be inserted. And on our phones, we can monitor the blood sugar and a pump that can be the insulin in the units. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we have technology today that we can do marvelous things. Listen, technology isn't evil. Technology is fantastic. It's the application of the technology that's evil. The internet is fantastic, but the pornography on the internet infects the whole thing, right? It's the application of the technology, not the technology itself. Good. Any other questions or comments? I'm very hungry. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> <laughs> My clock says 11.45.